Amazing. And with that, I would love to introduce our next esteemed speaker. Our next speaker holds an undergraduate degree in psychology and pre-med concentration from the University of New Hampshire and earned his MBA from Cornell, Cornell, wow, long day, from Cornell and his master's in uh, computing and education from Columbia. He's currently focused on utilizing unstructured data sources for clinical trial analytics, and his team is partnering with the Stanford AI for Health Initiative, as well as Snorkel AI to enable this work. He currently serves as the principal data scientist and data science technical lead at Genentech. Please welcome Michael D'Andrea. Great. Thanks, Hardy, for the introduction. I'm excited to be here. Great. So, hello, everyone. Um, again, excited to be here. The title of my presentation is Augmenting the Clinical Trial Design Process Utilizing Unstructured Protocol Data. I'm excited to take you on a journey that our team took a data-centric approach to unlocking the value of clinical trial protocol data. The agenda for today is first, I just wanna acknowledge the great work of a team and the partners such as Snorkel AI and the Stanford for AI Health Initiative that helped us on this journey. Second part, two through five, I will take you through the journey through the clinical trial design process and how we shifted to a data-centric approach and also give the two specific parts of the protocol, the inclusion and exclusion criteria and the schedule of assessments that the team focused on. So I feel very fortunate to be the presenter of this work and really the credit should go to the groups of people supporting the underlying work that I'm presenting. First, I wanna acknowledge the tremendous work of the three data scientists at Genentech Roche, whose work I'm largely presenting today. My appreciation goes out to Nandini, Claudia, and Ariana for your efforts on this work. Next, I'd like to recognize the amazing work of the Snorkel AI team who went above and beyond expectations and were key enablers of this work. Thanks, Paroma, Pierre, Hardy, Alex, and Quinn for your help. Next, I'd like to thank the broader clinical trial design project team who did much of the behind the scenes work supporting the data exploration Extra, extraction of data and marshalling of resources and contracting for our partnership. So thanks, Yasik, Marek, Alicia, Melody, James, Sam, and Harnor. Lastly, I just wanna highlight the exciting collaboration with the Stanford AI for Health program that Ryan, helped, Ryan Copping helped start and that we were able to build off of. Working with James, Eric, and Kevin on the trial performance metrics together, as well as learning from Shemra, Sam, and Rushan and the trial pathfinders team's domain expertise and insights for the inclusion exclusion criteria. So, uh, so are you ready to start the data centric journey? Let's give you some background on clinical trial protocols and how they fit into the bigger picture of medicine and the impact on patients. Let's start with some key statistics about drug and, drug and treatment development to give you how improving or augmenting clinical trials can have an impact. Last year in 2020, there was $198 billion spent on R&D around the world with an average of $2.6 billion for each drug. So a significant spend to bring a product across the full life cycle from research to patient utilization. Another key statistic that is good to be aware of is the number of treatments in the R&D pipeline each year. Last year for 2020, there were 18,582 treatments. And this number has been steadily increasing from the start of a century with a greater than 300% increase. So now that we have some data on the money spent on developing drugs and treatments and the increasing number of drugs being developed and researched every year, I now want to shift into what is a clinical trial protocol. A clinical trial protocol is essentially the plan for a trial. It includes details such as the study design, which patients to include, exclude, the type of assessments, and procedures that patients should undergo during a trial. It's worth noting that a protocol document can vary in length, are usually quite long. PDF documents, with some upwards of being 200 plus pages. 
and it can really vary across time, therapeutic area, indication, phase, and geography. The protocol design can have significant impacts on key trial performance metrics, such as the operational complexity, patient site friendliness, which our partners in the Stanford AI for Health program, in particular Professor Zhou, Eric, and Kevin Wu, have been able to go into far more detail in their paper that will be released in the near future. So now that we've gone over what is a clinical trial protocol, let's visualize the broad impact of, being, of using unstructured data in clinical trials. There's a lot of potentially useful information that is unstructured and blocked from usage in a clinical trial protocol. And by unlocking this information for analysis and data-informed decision-making, study design teams can increase, recruitment of can increase recruitment of diverse patient populations, reduce trial times and costs, and reduce patients dropping out from trials. These key trial performance metrics can reduce the overall cost for developing drugs and increase the number of drugs that can be handled in the pipeline, resulting in hopefully more cures and treatments for society. Lastly, by having data-informed study design tools, we can better evaluate treatments on diverse representative populations and gauge better the real-world efficacy, albeit with still significant limitations. So extracting this valuable unstructured data in the protocol though comes with its fair share of challenges. First, there is a tremendous amount of variability and diversity across trials. And this ranges from geographic to phase and therapeutic area. Also, even trials now with pre and post COVID have had to adapt to decentralized and remote trial operations. So major differences there. Second, the diversity of document formatting and authoring styles, which gets to the third area, that has been the works for some time and is likely to continue to be challenging, which is data standardization. The issue has been that it is a complex space with a broad variety of stakeholders that have very different incentives. So what parts of a protocol could yield useful information? To start, we focus on a couple we heard from our business partners and study design team partners that might be helpful, which are inclusion, exclusion criteria, and schedule of assessment sections. So let's take a look at what these sections of the protocol look like. The inclusion exclusion criteria or IE is essentially the filtering checklist for determining eligibility of patients for a trial. As you can see below, it can be quite detailed and even seemingly simple conditions can have multiple dependent conditions. On the right, the schedule of assessments is usually a tabular outline of what activities or procedures slash assessments a, a trial will consist of. This can range from screening patients to lab work assessments that check on key lab values during a trial. The timing and duration can vary tremendously and can be difficult to harmonize in this section. So now that we have a little context on clinical trials, the protocol document, and a few key parts like the IE and SLA, Remember that, remember these acronyms, IE and SLA, since I'll use those acronyms for the rest of the presentation. Let's now look at how data centricity played a major part in extracting useful information and real world impact for the data and the shift from a modeling centric to data centric AI approach. Many of you might be familiar with the CRISP-DM framework and it's common way of structuring the life cycle of a DS project, that data science project that continually iterates through the common parts. For our work, we really tried the gamut of approaches that largely built upon more sophisticated modeling approaches on larger medical corpi. The reality is that even the combination of NLP libraries, unsupervised learning techniques and medical BERT derived models we're limited in scalably having a business clinical impact. The challenge as many experienced practice, <laughs> the challenge as many experienced practitioners might know is that many data scientists are excited about the advanced modeling approaches and the latest research and keep the data fixed and focused 
and, and focus less on approaches to augment the data. As this next visual illustrates, the differences between model-centric and data-centric approaches are dramatic. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we took an aggregation of modeling-focused methods and were only able to derive count-based features, which had little clinical value for our teams. In contrast, the data-centric approach leveraged programmatic labeling with snorkel flow, was able to yield structured, clinically relevant features that our clinical scientists and study design teams can use for analysis and data-informed protocol design. The next two steps on this journey will take us to the actual two parts of the protocol that I mentioned earlier and where the basis for our teams work. I already introduced the IE and mentioned that it is essentially the filtering criteria for deciding who can be in a clinical trial. What I also want to share is that the design of a trial can benefit from analysis of large numbers of other similar trials. The current method of doing this is manual and done on a small scale with certain biases reinforced due to personal familiarity with certain types of research, indications, et cetera. As the second point mentions, manually sifting through hundreds of thousands of trials, and even more than that, looking for patterns on large scale relevant subsets for clinically relevant characteristics is especially challenging with the broad variety of medical terms and synonyms and conditional values that exist. The third point, is about how we came to start with the initial target for the IE. In order to find broad patterns that could be used for, for a variety of study design teams, we needed to find therapeutic area agnostic characteristics to start. This would yield some data that would be immediately generalizable for study teams. So what type of information would be therapeutic area agnostic? This led us to initially target the 21 chronic conditions that have been defined by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, which have linked ICD-10 codes to help with this definition. You can, see in the, you can see this list in the table on the right. How was this accomplished? For the methods we use, the Snorkel AI platform, Snorkel Flow, were able to deliver a data set that we hope to consider sharing publicly at a later date, and also the corresponding label models, labeling models and pipelines. Lastly, this data was the foundation for demographic trade-off analysis, functionality, and tooling, which was the basis for even more exciting impact beyond this project. For IE task setup, this visualization shows on the left an example of the type of input that is being taken in with multiple chronic conditions and the breakout of IE. Then on the right, is the output from data, the data-centric pipeline that determines if the chronic condition is in the IE. I just wanna take a moment to give a sample of the type of challenges that you encounter with IE data and to show that this is not a trivial problem. The first example is given how we were extracting criteria related to drug abuse. And then you can see the confusion with references to the study drug or just using the word drug. Even the example of rubbing alcohol was an unexpected false positive that would be, not be surfaced if we were not taking the data-centric approach where we truly iterated and learned the data inside and out. The second example is really about chronic conditions having some crossover amongst each other and the challenges of this compounded by conditional clauses. Lastly, there were even grammatical errors in the protocol and negation was especially tricky to fix. We do, not, we do want to note that this is still very much a process to continue improving the data and by no means did we catch everything, but this opened our eyes to the complexity that would have been hidden if we had not focused on the data. Here's the data-centric pipeline that we built to accomplish this. And Nandini, Pierre, and Proma really are the people that I would ask for the deeper technical details. Some key highlights to note at a higher level is that this is a very complex multi-step pipeline that I know from experience would be extremely difficult to orchestrate with even a highly skilled data engineering team. The Snorkel Flow platform made this pipeline develop almost a drag and drop experience as the application editor would be able to show you. 
The pipeline is run over 340,000 plus protocols and gives us the output for all 21 CMS chronic conditions. Using the data-centric pipeline, the results are very strong and generalizable on the validation and test sets. We also did another evaluation, which we call egregious error evaluation. And it really is about catching the types of errors that are quite obvious and easy to diagnose. For this metric, we essentially reduced this to zero, which is really incredible. And all the credit really goes to Nandini, who came up with her own more detailed framework for this. Given this great performance on the data set we created with the IE CMS chronic conditions, we were able to use it for the demographic trade-off analysis that I mentioned earlier. This is really exciting work that illustrates the power to find the latent and implicit biases that exist in our data. The second downstream impact is the incorporation of this data into the analysis for the study design tool that clinical scientists use. Now we are on the final step of our journey and we'll look at the data centric SOA. You remember what SOA stands for? Hopefully, because I'm not gonna remind you. I'm just joking. Um, yeah, SOA stands for schedule of assessments. And as you can see, the first column is usually for a list of assessments or procedures. Think of it like the steps are planned in a trial. It's a bit different though, depending on the trial. And this variability is definitely obscured by this example because it's a lot more complex and already in um, Claudia can definitely attest to that. Okay, so for this work, we had a little more complex problem because we had to first extract the procedures from the first column in the table. Then we want to categorize that list of procedures into clinically relevant categories. Let's now clarify this and scope this a little bit further. As we just mentioned, I want to extract information from the SOA tables in the PDF document. Claudia and Artie, who work quite hard on this part, can tell you that this was a lot more work and a lot more steps to even find the right table and then build the right representation to extract only the procedures from that table. The second step is given this procedure information extracted from the table, categorize these procedures. Artie again and with Ariana, they use a categorization schema we use, we derive from Yasik's work with Tufts. Similar to the IE, we also use the Snorkel AI platform and the output was the list of procedures with the Tufts categorization as well and the supporting classification model. That seems straightforward, right? That is until you start working with the data. Similar to the IE task, there are many challenges. Harmonization of terms like the ECG, acronyms and synonymous terms, which were very common, and even the ontologies and keyword matching systems had difficulty detecting these. There could also be multiple procedures in a single line. Lastly, very similar text could throw off the text similar algorithms and measures, as you can see with these two examples, patient global impression and clinical global impression. For, with the scoping, the task up was a little more straightforward. The first task can be illustrated with this visual. As you can see, the table has some procedures and those are output to a list of procedures on the right. For part two, the text classification of procedures, here's an overview that Ariana and Artie can describe in more detail. The key, as the slide mentions, is the creation of representative evaluation set. So that can be robust, generalizable, and gives a real indicator of how it would actually work in production. Using circle flow, the team was able to iteratively, iteratively improve and work on the data. And as you can see in the UI in the bottom right, this is how it would look. This interface with how you would iterate through this cycle. Here is a high, high level technical overview of the exciting work that Artie, Claudia, and Ariana worked on. I don't want to gloss over the details, but for the sake of brevity, I'm merely giving an overview of it. I think, again, the key point is the ability to build complex multi-state solutions with, even in Ariana's case, the use of a custom use of the coder model in one stage. It really allowed a lot of flexibility and iteration and innovation that would not be easy if we use another solution or platform. Well, you're probably wondering, did this complexity yield good results? For the document text extraction task, 
Claudia and Audi were able to get it to a working solution within only six weeks. We aimed for 80% plus on F1, and this was surpassed within the time frame. For the second step, the procedure ta task classification that Ariana and Artie worked on, this performance was also quite strong. Lastly, how does this impact the business or patients? This output is useful for estimation of clinical trial burden and the analysis of study design in the tool mentioned earlier. This is also contributing to the harmonization of data within the organization and has the ability to more flexibly adapt to changes in schema since it's programmatic. Okay, thank you for making time to listen to my presentation. I'll do my best to answer any questions on the behalf of the team. Thank you so much for the presentation, Michael. I'm sure for a lot of our attendees, it was really exciting to see you know, how you use these data-centric approaches as well as programmatic labeling on a real-world task and domain, which is like clinical trial analysis. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, and also, it's been a pleasure working with you, Claudia and Ariana, at least on I've been working on the SOA use case, as you mentioned. So really exciting work there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been quite exciting. Um, yeah. So we have a question from the audience. Molly asks, when you find false positives, what is the process for iterating to mitigate? Yeah, without um, <laughs> rebating the process, it depends on each one, but we did have kind of um, iterative process. And definitely, like we, we said, there's different types of errors. There's no, certain errors are closer to being more wrong than others. So um, as you mentioned, that egregious error validation, your traditional machine learning metrics, your F1, your precision recall were kind of the common metrics. Mm -hmm. But I think we also wanted to have this, you know, you, everyone has their own cherry pick, train test split. We also want to have uh, maybe like a held out sample that we can be evaluated by a different group to kind of reduce the bias within the um, implementing team. So. That makes sense. And you've touched on this before in your presentation too, which is like, you know, careful curation of a validation and test set. Could you talk a little more about, you know, uh, what that involves in a little more detail there? Yeah, so in for clinical trials, it's, as we mentioned, a lot of variability. There's a lot of different therapeutic areas, um, you know, range from oncology to, um, you know, neurology, there's just a lot wide differences. And then the sizes of the trials, like an early phase one trial might be very small to now we've probably seen the news, these phase three, four trials, there were tens of thousands of patients. And then you have to look at across different geographies. And now even, so you really have to understand like, oh, are you overly skewed towards earlier trials? Like there's even a cutoff date we're looking at 2018. What's the difference between 2018 after? Before 2015, um, some regulatory differences. So you, you really being aware of those differences and making sure you get a representative sample because you might think, oh, I'm doing really great. But then when you test in real production use cases, it might not work as well as planned. But yeah, great, great question. That makes sense. Goes back to a lot of the, you know, uh, like distribution shift or domain shift examples that we've been seeing as well. Like as long as you're aware of where the regulation is changing, you can curate a valid and test set. But in the future, if you deploy it and they change, how do you detect that? How do you deal with it? So um, lots of exciting points there. Yeah, it's, it's a great question and challenge. And I think, you know, I don't think there's a clear, like we have automated way to do it. We just, you know, we're fortunate to have tools that can adapt. And, you know, like I said, the, the advantage of Snorkel is just the programmatic labeling. Like if we have a changes, we can iterate. We're able to change even the, the schema, what we're able to say, okay, suddenly this is different, how we define things. So that mm -hmm. is really important other than having to manually relabel everything. And, and retrain our models off that. So that makes sense. To add to that, uh, like we had, we did this experiment where you know we started with fifty or something documents just to start get to a score, and then adding fifty more documents was super easy. We just ran the same functions on the whole data, and it was just click button to get to working with a new data set and then applying it there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. You were saying no. no I, I just want to that's... emphasize the the scaling is really the key thing. I mean, there's a lot of great solutions. People can do a lot of great work with, you know, modeling is a lot of, but scaling it up to a lot of different conditions is very challenging. And doing it with a, a small team is really tough. So, I think that's what was really powerful about this project and working with you guys. That makes sense. And 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 to emphasize that a little bit, you know, a lot of this data is super private, so you can't you know send it out uh, to be labeled. You have to do it in house with your small team. So it really yeah. just underlines the, the scalability issue there. Um, we have a question from Vin. He says, and or they say, sorry, uh, new domain for me. Do any of these techniques help predict the results of a clinical trial sooner ahead of time or with less information? 
So that's a great question. Um, we actually do look at the clinical endpoints and we are correlating. These are all correlations, of course. So, you know, and then things can change. So it doesn't mean correlation equals causation, but yeah, definitely there's um, strong correlations we're seeing in the data. And we do hope that this will make better informed trials. Um, definitely it is up to those clinical scientists and site design teams who have a lot of experience and domain expertise to kind of use this with some caveats, but um, yeah, we can definitely see some impacts, especially things like, um, like I said, the demographic bias analysis or trade-off analysis, mm -hmm. like you, there's things of asthma, um, hypertension that we weren't aware of certain populations that the data is surfacing these things. So Right. That makes sense. And, and going off of that, you mentioned a couple of use cases, you know, that we've worked on already. What are some other initiative of use cases uh, that, that, that you're excited to work on next? I mean, just continue to scale this work. I mean, we just looked at the 21 chronic conditions and being able to do more, like with taking this to more ICD-10 codes, um, mm -hmm. being able to, you know, do more documents and different, is this is the protocol, as you said, is like 200 plus pages. So there's other sections, there's other right. endpoints, there's, you know, and that, to that point, the, those endpoints, like when they, are we measuring the right endpoints? You know, what's that key KPI to what right. that input is? to what those assessments are. There's so many different things, but it, the challenge is just pulling this information to a manner that can be structured and analyzed. So that's where the heavy lift is. So Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, for participants who might be unfamiliar, I know Michael touched on this, but these are like 300 page, 200, 300 page clinical trial documents, information rich, that have all sorts of various formats for different companies. And so <laughs> it's really yeah. like, yeah. Tr when I first started this, I was like, why, why can't there just be a rule that's like, you know, <laughs> extract yeah. this table and do this? And it's like the, the level of variability that you see across yeah. everything and, and it could change. And uh, so so that's really the, the challenge and also the excitement around. I think, I think that's just such a great point. That's that's why we want to emphasize the challenges, because I think a lot of people obscure that. They're like, oh, yeah, the data is simple. It's, it's just, and you kind of would assume it would be this like drop down list. Hey, it should be categorized towards this. But there's a lot of challenges with that and coming to some consensus across the organization, even within the company, right. it's challenging. So um, definitely that, that's kind of why this exists, this challenge. So. Makes sense. Uh, Nick asks another question. He asks, are there any limitations for this approach or could these be applied to just about any types of clinical trial with or without modification? Yeah, you know, I, I always want to give caveats and say, I, you know, it kind of depends. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, there could be some more opportunities to expand this, extend it. I think we'd have to kind of look at it, assess it and see. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely we are planning to expand it beyond this. And um, the clinical scientists were what they very excited <laughs> to be able to have what they needed for their trials. Like I said, the, originally we we're using like discount based features, which were, were not at the granular level. And right. you have to be able to trust that those features were extracted at the level and all those challenges that we've encountered, the negation, all these things gave them the trust that we're extracting at that right level and that they can have faith in the patterns we're extracting. So, but Makes yeah, sense. great question. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one last question from Hiromu. He said, how was the six weeks, not months spent? <laughs> what part of the pipeline <laughs> development took longer than others? And maybe I can chime in, but after yeah. you, Michael, if you'd like to cop, yeah. I mean, it, from my perspective, and I think Artie, you might be able to speak better to this, but I mean, it, it seemed a lot of it's just understanding the data. And again, this whole data centric approach, understanding the data, understanding the challenges with it, scoping that out, you know, ironically, probably labeling functions become more straightforward once you kind of understand it a little bit more. But, yeah. I agree with Michael. It's just, a, you know, it's, it's a far more complicated task than you first realize when you first approach yeah. it and seeing the level of variability, understanding, you know, splitting the data the right way. You know, a lot of the time consuming steps it, it is just the stuff outside of, you know, the model itself. And as we've seen throughout this conference, but it's like, uh, sorry, this event, uh, but it's like curating the right validation and tests that requires you to dig through your yeah. data, to actually see the variability. Yeah. And that is fairly time consuming as well. But again, yeah. that is uh, just... Th things to get to, to, to a good set. Um, let's just take one last question from Nick. Uh, he says, per Andrew's earlier point, what feedback would you give to the average clinician, clinician to improve their data for future modeling? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't have a good response off the top of my head, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I think just being able to look at the, the wider variety of data and be able to leverage tools that look at broader patterns um, I think a lot of it right now, and, and they don't have the tools because it's just like, hey, this is what I'm familiar with. This is, I look at small subsets, I build a spreadsheet, 
But now that we have the ability to structure larger pieces of data, we can look mm -hmm. at the broader trends. And that's what's exciting. And I think that working with the clinical scientists, we're able to do that right now, extract broader patterns. That's where the chronic conditions are exciting. They can see, okay, if I exclude some of asthma, how does this impact demographics? How does it impact the endpoints? How does it impact you know, a lot of other things that they weren't able to even see before because it, it wouldn't be scalable for them to read 100,000 <laughs> protocols. Right, uh, right, right. Categorize that, so. That makes yeah. sense. Uh, well, thank you so much, Michael, for the wonderful talk. Again, it's a pleasure working with you and it's great, you know, for the audience members also to see how we're using this data-centric AI approaches and techniques on a real-world task and yeah. for clinical trials. Uh, so really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.